Hi friends, this is Riti Joshi and today I am going to talk about spine anatomy. Let's see. The vertebral column is made up of 33 vertebral segments, 7 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral and 4 coccygeal vertebral segments. Let's see about typical and atypical vertebra. How we can differentiate this? The atypical vertebra has no vertebral body like C1 and C2 vertebra. In contrary to this, typical vertebra has vertebral body, articular uh, process like spinous process and transverse process. For example, C3 to C7 vertebra. Now we are going to see the parts of vertebra. Body, neural arch, posterior elements, lamina, pars interarticularis, these are the parts of vertebra. Let's have a look on that. First, this is body of the vertebra. This is the anterior portion of the vertebra. That's why it's known as the body of the vertebra. The neural arch. Neural arch is made up of pedicle and posterior elements. Neural arch is uh, divided into the pedicle and posterior elements. The main function of neural arch is to transmit the bending or tension from posterior element to the vertebral bodies. Now we are going to see about the posterior part of vertebra. It includes spinous process, transverse process and lamina. Main function of this posterior part is for muscle attachment and increased liver arm for muscles of this vertebral column. Now we are going to see the lamina. Lamina is uh, very thin. Main function of lamina is to transfer the force from posterior elements to the pedicles, throw them to the vertebral body. This is pars interarticularis. This is the portion of uh, lamina that is between the superior and inferior articular process. The articular process main function uh, is a superior and inferior articular process that uh, transmit the force. Now we are going to see the intervertebral disc. It, be, it is composed of three parts, nucleus pulposus, annulus fibrosis and end plate. This is nucleus pulposus. This is the inner part of the uh, vertebr intervertebral disc. This is annulus fibrosis. The nucleus pulposus is a gelatinous material which is situ uh, situated inside means inner part of the disc. Annulus fibrosis, this is the outer ring part. This, this is called the outer ring part and vertebral end plate. So vertebral end plate is the outer layer of superior and inferior surface of the disc. Now we are going to see about the motion of vertebral segment. How motion will occur in vertebral segment? This motion occur in vertebra due to three joint. First joint is formed between two vertebral bodies and intervertebral disc. This is two vertebral bodies and this is intervertebral disc. Another two joint is formed by articulation of superior articular process of inferior vertebra and inferior articular process of superior vertebra that is known as zygopofacial joints or facet joint. Let's have a quick look for C1 vertebra. This is C1 vertebra. I roughly tried to draw that vertebra. It is also known as atlas. It don't have a body. We can see that the previous vertebra uh, part, they have body. Here we don't find any body. It is consist of anterior and posterior arch. This is posterior arch, anterior arch and it has two lateral mass. This is transverse process, superior articular facet and this is foramen. This C1 vertebra will articulate with the skulls and occipital condyle so that's why it known as atlanto occipital joint 
now we are going to see c2 vertebra it also known as axis it doesn't have body we can see that it also doesn't have any body main function is allow rotation of cervical spine the atlas is directly sit on the axis it articulate with the inferior articular uh, process of atlas and the vertical process called dance this is dance and the in inferior articular facet of atlas it directly sit on the dance and that's why it become atlanto axial joint now we are going to see about c3 to c7 vertebra the vertebral body of subaxial cervical spine have upward projection on lateral margin that known as uncinate process this process articulate with the level above from the uncovertebral joint which is known as joint of lusca the transverse process has hole called transverse foramen that allows vertebral artery to travel through it it uh, the c3 to c7 has a bifid spinous process means two prong that allows for attachment of muscles bilaterally this is superior articular facet this is neural arch this is transverse process now we are going to see the thoracic vertebra the thoracic vertebra it is made up of spinous process intervertebral foramen transverse process body and lamina so in this we can see that this is the transverse process which is for uh, downward inferiorly and very long this is projected downward and inferiorly then intervertebral foramen the intervertebral foramen is large and less prone for nerve compression this is transverse process it's a posterolateral transverse process this is body it is the heart shaped and progressively it will it will increase from t1 to t12 the lamina it's a vertical and roof type of arrangement in thoracic vertebra from t1 to t12 it has a costal and transverse facet this is cause uh, this is costal facet and the transverse facet so both side of the vertebra has a smooth rounded facet known as costo vertebral joint rib at, uh, ribs at the level of t2 to t9 articulate with the synovial joint t1 t10 t11 and t12 vertebra form the joint between or form from down the joint with first rib and has a single articulation on each side T11 and T12 are floating ribs ribs and spinous process limit the motion of the sub, uh, thoracic spine that keeps the strain of the cervical and the lumbar spine and close uh, to less mobile thoracic spine and make them more prone for the injury the junctional vertebra like C6 T2 T2 and T11 to L2 and the adjacent region are more prone for injury now we are going to see about the lumbar vertebra this is lumbar vertebra this is the lumbar vertebra body from l5 to uh, l1 to l5 it will increase progressively this is the pedicle it is very long and wider than the thoracic vertebrae this is the spinous process it is horizontal uh, and square the transverse process is uh, smaller than the thoracic region and the intervertebral foramen is large so but uh, but now increased um, like impingement of the nerve is more in lumbar region now we are going to see about sacrum five vertebra fuse together in a triangular shape bone this is sacrum and this is coccyx so coccyx is a tail uh, tailbone four fused vertebra are there together this is known as a sacrococcygeal joint let's have a look for ligaments so what are the ligaments in spine annulus fibrosus anterior longitudinal ligament posterior longitudinal ligament and ligamentum flavum so annulus fibrosus 
it is located in the, the cervical thoracic and lumbar region what is the main function of this it restrict the distraction and rotation of vertebral bodies this is anterior longitudinal ligament it from c2 to sacrum and the fully developed in cervical region low in thorax and lumbar region main function of anterior longitudinal ligament it limit the extension this screen one is the posterior longitudinal ligament it start from c2 to sac and end to sacrum the broad in cervical and thoracic region and narrow in lumbar region that's why we have like prolapse intervertebral disc in lumbar region it limits the flexion this one is uh, orange is ligamentum flammum it is also from c2 to sacrum it is very thick in lumbar region cervical and thoracic region it is thin and broad main function of ligamentum flammum it limit the forward flexion in lumbar vertebra this is brew one is interspinous ligament the ligaments are anterior atlanto axial ligament it's located in c2 occipital bone it limits the extension tectorial membrane it's located in c2 occipital bone it limits forward flexion posterior atlanto axial ligament it's located in atlas c1 and axis c2 it limits the flexion supraspinous ligament is it is located in thoracic and lumbar region c7 to l3 and l4 it uh, the function is limit the forward flexion ligamentum nuque it is located in the occipital pro, occipital protuberance of c7 limit forward flexion interspinous ligament located in lumbar region limit forward flexion lr ligament located in atlas and axis means atlas c1 and axis c2 limit same side head rotation iliolumbar ligament it located on the lower lumbar region and res it resist the sliding of l5 over s1 now we are going to see about the arthrology atlanto occipital joint it is synovial joint and a synovial articulation between occiput and c1 atlanto axial joint non synovial articulation between dense of c2 vertebra and anterior arch of c1 next is facet joint facet joint is a diarthrodal joint it is composed of superior and inferior articular process cervical and uh, thorax facet are flat and lumbar it may curved in intervertebral joint the joint between intervertebral disc and superior and inferior vertebral body is known as intervertebral joint then sacroiliac joint it is syndesmosis type of joint made up of articular shaped joint surface of sacrum and ilium let's have a closer look on facet joint this is facet joint also known as zygopofacial joints formed by inferior articular process of vertebra formed by inferior articular process of vertebra and superior articular process of vertebra below so this is known as facet joint facets are synovial and gliding joint it has different orientation according to its anatomical location let's have a look for facet joint orientation facet joints are responsible for directing the movement of spine in cervical region it is 45 degree frontal plane and the short spinous process and the shape of disc the backward and downward orientation of the articular facet and movement of the cervical region is greater than any other region in thoracic region the orientation of facet joint is 60 degree so it allows a lateral flexion and rotation 
so we cannot do flexion or extension in thoracic region in lumbar region the orientation of facet is 90 degree in sagittal plane and only flexion and extension moment is available for that costo transverse joint it is the articulation between the rib and transverse process and vertebral body it is important to know about the thoracic joint rule of 3 so what is rule of 3 the rule of 3 means spinous process and the transverse process are at level or above the level or the below the level we need to know so first of all let's see about the t1 to t3 vertebra so t1 to t3 vertebra are same level means at the level for spinous and transverse process t4 to t6 one half level below transverse process of same level t7 to t9 one full level below then in order to remember uh, this rule of 3 we can just say that reversely we should go up so for t7 to t9 it's one full level below so for t10 just start one full level below t11 one half level below means one half level below and t12 at the level like this way we can remember the rule of 3 let's have a look for lumbar pelvic rhythm lumbar joint is formed anteriorly by wedge shaped intervertebral disc and posteriorly by l5 and s1 facet when head moves forward pelvic shift backward for balance the forward movement begins at the upper uh, segment of the spine when it reach to the lumbar spine and when it reach to the lumbar spine the lumbar spine uh, lordosis flattens and it go for flexion when re again return to the normal upright position first pelvic tilt posteriorly means hip goes in extension then lumbar spine extends then we can again get the lordosis then rest of the spine get extend now we are going to see about arthrokinematic motions so arthrokinematics of atlanto occipital joint so here we can see that the concave atlas and convex occiput so when forward bending or head flexion will occur occiput will roll anteriorly occipital roll anteriorly this way and it will glide posteriorly when head extension or backward bending is there so occiput will roll posteriorly oxip head extension will occur so occiput go for rolling in posteriorly and glide anteriorly in side bending occiput roll contralaterally now we are going to see atlanto axial joint arthrokinematics so here the concave surface is inferior atlas facet and convex surface is superior axis facet this is dense so that is convex and this is atlas concave so when flexion or forward bending will occur so atlas pivots on axis this is atlas it pivots on axis because this is kind of a hole and dense so this atlas is seated on axis and that's why it will pivot on axis even in backward bending or extension atlas again pivot on axis during rotation atlas rotate ipsilateral on axis means like this way it will rotate now we are going to see thoracic spine arthrokinematics 
फ्रेंड्स इट इज इम्पॉर्टेंट टू रिमेंबर दिस थोरेसिक एंड लंबर स्पाइन का पल मोशन एंड अर्थोपाइनेमेटिक्स दैट विल हेल्प यू फॉर मोबिलाइजेशन सो फ्लेक्शन एंड एक्सटेंशन इट वोट अगर सेपरेटली इन थोरेसिक स्पाइन इट कपल विथ लंबर स्पाइन सो फ्लेक्शन इन थोरेसिक स्पाइन वॉट विल अकर इन अर्थ्रोकाइनेमेटिक मोशन लेट्स हैव अ लुक ऑन दैट सो ड्यूरिंग फ्लैक्शन मोमेंट फॉर एग्जाम्पल लेट्स ड्रॉ दैट दिस इज लाइक एज्यूम दिस इज द पेशेंट he is standing erect now he is going for flexion so he moves like that this is flexion and if he come like this way from this bending position this is standing position so it known as extension so first of all if the patient is going in the flexion so what happens in that during flexion the these are the uh, articular facet this is superior articular facet this is inferior articular facet so when patient is moving this way flexion bending so inferior facet this is the inferior facet of superior vertebra glides up and forward inferior facets glides up and forward on superior facet of inferior vertebra let's make clear this is superior articular facet this is inferior articular facet this is superior articular facet this is inferior articular facet so when this is superior vertebra this is inferior vertebra when we are doing flexion that time this facets the inferior facet of superior vertebra glides up and forward on superior facet this is the superior facet of inferior vertebra during extension same way the inferior facet of superior vertebra glide down on superior facet of inferior vertebra glide down during right lateral flexion right inferior facet for example this is a uh, uh, inferior facet so right lateral flexion the right inferior facet of superior vertebra slide inferiorly and left facet this is the left facet of superior vertebra slide superiorly now we are going to see arthrokinematics of lumbar spine the spine facet orient in sagittal plane so now we are going to see the lumbar spine rotation so when lumbar spine rotation is occur inferior facet of contralateral superior vertebra this all are facets this are facet this are facet so inferior face this is inferior facet of contralateral superior vertebra compress against the superior facet of ipsilateral vertebra separates from superior facet of inferior vertebra so don't get in complication of this just remember that right rotation right facet gapping will occur when side bending occurs the inferior facet of superior vertebra will slide up on contralateral side of side bending and down on ipsilateral side of side bending let's see the osteokinematic motion position and capsular pattern of spine now we are looking for the cervical spine in cervical spine already we seen we have seen that flexion extension lateral flexion and rotation will occur in thoracic uh, spine uh, flexion extension lateral flexion and rotation 
just remember that flexion and extension occur with uh, thoracic and lumbar spine together flexion and extension lumbar uh, lateral flexion and rotation is also occur in osteokinematic motions the open back position is midway between flexion and extension closed back position with extension capsular pattern lateral flexion and rotation are equally limited and extension let's see range of motion cervical flexion 80 to 90 degree extension 70 side bending 20 to 45 rotation 70 to 90 degree for thoracic spine flexion 20 to 45 degree extension 25 to 45 degree side bending 20 to 40 rotation is 35 to 50 degrees for a lumbar spine flexion is 40 to 60 degree extension 20 to 35 degree side bending is 15 to 20 degree and rotation is 3 to 18 degrees let's see the couple motion this will help you for mobilization of spine the movement of a spine or vertebral column occur in a diagonal pattern as a combination of flexion extension with couple motion of side bending and rotation for zygomorphial joint or facet joint movement occur in upward or downward direction if this movement occur in same direction flexion and extension will occur if it is in opposite side bending will occur if patient is normal so cervical thoracic and lumbar spine involves both this side of the segment simultaneously move so it will move simultaneously and same axis so right side produce motion same side motion on left side but if patient is having hyper or hypermobility this case will alter just to remember couple motion hip couple with the innominate motion lumbar couple with the sacral motion nutation means nod anterior tilt of sacrum in sagittal plane counter nutation posterior tilt of sacrum in sagittal plane we are learning about the spine anatomy so we need to know about the red flags which help us to assess the spine so what are the red flags for spine if the patient is age is less than 20 or greater than 55 and he is having persistent night pain so that means there is something systemic involvement so we need to immediately refer that patient to their physician if the patient is having bowel bladder involvement or bowel bladder changes so that is again a red flag we need to notify the physician patient is having past medical history of cancer no chemical uh, no mechanical back pain um, patient is having mid thoracic pain, uh, pain that indicates myocardial infarction or uh, gallbladder diseases because gallbladder referred pain will come to mid thoracic spine pain from uh, 6th to 10th vertebra indicates peptic ulcer history of prostate cancer pulse, um, pulsating low back pain indicates a vascular problem means aortic aneurysm sometime patient come to you and uh, complain that he is feeling pulses in the low back pain so you need to uh, diagnose that a patient might have aortic aneurysm uh, fons nodules um, indicates spina bifida and the cafe at uh, late sports indicate neurofibromatosis upper back or uh, neck pain increase with the deep breathing coughing uh, laughing and decrease uh, with uh, expiration now we are going to learn the landmarks so for landmarks uh, we need to add how to identify this c1 one finger width below the mastoid process you have to keep two finger width below the occipital protuberance you can notice the c1 vertebrae c2 vertebrae we can notice at the angle of mandible three finger width below the occipital protuberance so you have to keep your three finger below the occipital protuberance you can notice the c2 vertebra c3 to c4 posterior to hyoid bone 
C7 base of the neck we can notice that the one prominent posterior spinous process that is C7 T2 like superior angle of scapula T7 inferior angle of scapula T10 at the level of cephoid process T12 at the level of 12th rib L3 at the level of posterior umbilical posterior to the umbilicus L4 at the level of iliac wrist and S2 at the level of PSIS. Let's see for the nerve supply dorsal and ventral nerve root. Each level of the spinal nerve root exceeds the spinal cord and has a specific motor and sensory function. So cervical spine ex now exits above their corresponding vertebra body level. For example, uh, C7 nerve root exits above the C7 through C6, C7 neural foramen and the C8 exit between T1 and C7 because uh, we don't have a C8 vertebra. The thoracic and lumbar spinal nerve roots are exit below their corresponding vertebral level. For example, L3 nerve root exits below L3 through L3 and L4 foramen. It's important to know this level which help us to diagnose the uh, radiculopathy and understand the radiculopathy. It is also important to know that the spinal cord will terminate at the level of T2 to L12. So lumbar puncture is done below the L2 level. Here it is important to mark that if uh, this cervical spine exit above their corresponding and lumbar spine and thoracic spine roots exit below their corresponding vertebral level. Now we are going to see the muscles. So first of all we are going to learn about sternocleidomastoid muscle. This is sternocleidomastoid muscle. It has two head, sternal head and clavicular head. The sternal head is originated from superior aspect of manibrum of the sternum and the clavicular aspect from medial one third of the clavicle. It insert over the mastoid process. Main action is if it is working unilaterally. So same side bending and opposite side rotation. If working bilaterally, flexion of head and neck. Let's see the scalene muscle. For origin of the scalene muscles, for it has three um, parts: anterior, middle, and posterior. So, if anterior fiber is there, so it is originated from transverse process of C3 to C7 vertebra. Transverse process of C3. Here we can notice this. This is third vertebra. So C3 to C here C7 vertebra. This is seven vertebra. And it is inserted anterior fiber. It will insert it to the first rib. For middle fiber it will originate from C2. This is middle fiber originated from C2 to C7. And the posterior fiber is originated from C5 to C7. The insertion of uh, anterior scalene at the first rib, middle scalene again at the first rib, and the posterior scalene external surface of second rib here. The main action of uh, scalene muscle is if it is working bilaterally flexion of the neck, if it is working unilaterally lateral flexion of the neck. This will assist uh, in inspiration and elevation of first and second rib as the anterior fiber is attached here and the uh, middle fiber is attached on the second rib. 
Now we are going to see splenius capitis muscle. It is originated from mastoid process. Originated from the mastoid process and the lateral superior nuchal line and inserted to the ligament nuchae and the spinous process of C7 to T3. This is C7 to here we can see that this is C7 vertebra. This is not the approximated level I drawn but this is just for drawing assume that this is the C7 vertebra. Innervation from the dorsal rami of C2. The main action uh, like if it is working unilaterally so same side flexion and rotation of your neck. So this is your head same side flexion of your head and neck if it is working bilaterally so it will help you in extension now we are going to see the splenius cervicis muscle so it is originated from c1 to c3 vertebra and it inserted to t3 to t6 spinous process innervation from c2 to c8 dorsal rami if uh, splenius cervici cervices is working unilaterally so same side flexion lateral flexion and rotation of your neck same side flexion and rotation of your neck if it is working bilaterally extension of your neck now we are going to see rectus abdominis muscle it is originated from crest of the pubis and inserted to the xiphoid process and cartilage of 5th to 7th rib. Innervation from intercostal nerve T7 to T12. Action, flexion of the trunk and posterior tilt of the pelvic. This is external oblique muscle. <coughs> it is orina originated from 4th to 12th rib. This is external intercostal muscle. This is this all is external intercostal muscle. This is originated from lateral side of 4th to 12th rib and inserted to the iliac crest and linea alba. It is innervated by intercostal nerve from T8 to L2. If external oblique is working bilaterally that will help you in flexion of your trunk and posterior tilting of your pelvis if it is working unilaterally so your trunk will rotate in opposite direction means contralateral trunk rotation and ipsilateral trunk flexion this is most important don't get confused in internal oblique and external oblique action Internal oblique you can rotate same side, external oblique rotate opposite side. Let's see internal oblique muscle. It is originated from iliac crest, inguinal ligament, thoracolumbar fascia, inserted to 9 to 12 lab, ribs uh, and linea alba. Innervated by intercostal nerves T8 to L2. If internal oblique works unilaterally that will help you to flex your trunk and same side rotation. If it is working bilaterally trunk flexion and increase intraabdominal pressure and intrathoracic pressure. Now we are going to see transverso abdominis muscle. It is originated from iliac wrist thoracolumbar fascia and cartilage of 6th to 12th rib and inguinal ligament inserted over the linea alba innervation intercostal now T7 to T12 action is uh, increased intraabdominal pressure increased tension in the thoracolumbar fascia now we are going to see the iliosvas muscle this is iliacus and swas major collectively known as iliosvas swas major originated from transverse process of t12 to l5 and iliacus is from iliac fossa 
inserted to the laser trochanter of femur innervated by the femoral nerve the main action of iliopsoas muscle is hip flexion trunk flexion and anterior tilt of pelvic now we are going to see quadratus lumborum muscle originated from crest of ilium and inserted to the transverse process of l1 l4 and 12th rib it is innervation from ventral lami of t12 to l3 main action if it is working bilaterally extension of your back or extension of lumbar region if it is working unilaterally lateral flexion of your trunk erector spinae is made up of three muscle uh, spinae spinalis longissimus and iliocostalis just remember s l i so here this is spinalis this is longissimus and this one is ilio costalis so origin of uh, this muscle is from t9 to t1 and mid uh, medial slope of dorsal segment of iliac crest like this way it will go inserted to the spinous process of t1 t2 and cervical vertebrae so there it will become cervicis uh, cervicis muscle and innervation from posterior branch of spinal nerve and action is spine extension thanks for watching and for future videos don't forget to subscribe if you have any doubts related to topics in physical therapy exams please let me know in my comment section so i can make a series of the videos on that till that time stay positive bye bye